Time having arrived, I hereby call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. Uh, this evening, uh, Superintendent Smith has a special guest to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I am very excited tonight to introduce you to a freshman at the high school. Uh, his name is Aaron Smith. And I have to tell you that I met Aaron uh, in the hallways of Brockton High. Um, he recognized me and was excited, first of all, that we share a last name. In conversation, one of the things he also shared with me is that he enjoys, he said to me, I enjoy watching you on cable. And I said to him, Aaron, where do you watch me on cable? And he said, I always watch Community Access Channel 12. And he obviously watches us in the school committee meetings. I'm very excited when I have a student from the high school who is interested enough in city government, information about the schools, to be interested in what's happening in his school. So um, I want to tell you, Aaron is a wonderful student at Brockton High School. He's a talented artist, and he's really excited tonight. I'd like to introduce him to come and join me to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Aaron, let me give you this. I'm going to just hook this here on your, right there. And you're going to grab You're going to turn around and face the flag. Grab my arm. And I'll get your I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Would you like to say a few words? Mm -hmm. Aaron would like to share with you a few words about Brockton High and his great experience. So as you all know me, my name is Aaron Smith, and I'm related to Miss Smith. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, I'm happy to be at Brockton High because I have good teachers, a pair, and friends. Hmm, what else? What's your class? And I have good classmates. Well, that's I already said. Well, that's okay. I'm pretty sure all you wouldn't mind. And and I'm very happy to have Miss Waldo as my principal. <laughs> and what I am also happy about is that to be here in an audience to see me. And let's see what else. What would you like to do in the future, Aaron? Well, I hope I have a nice future someday, as long as I can get along with friends and families. And maybe use those art talents? And use my art talents to make people cheerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. And I'm going to have you share with Gavin your microphone. We're right. give Thank you. Okay. Excellent job, honey. Very proud of you. So just to show you, this was uh, Aaron's artwork freehand. And uh, again, we have such talented students at Brockton High School. They come in all shapes and sizes. And we're so pleased for all of you to get to see the talent that we have here at the high school. So again, thank you, Aaron. And I hope you continue to watch us on Channel 12, uh, Community Access Cable. So thank you. So I'm going to mention here Please. in and do the uh, moment of silence. Uh -huh. Uh, we normally open each meeting uh, with hearing of visitors. That's an opportunity for members of the public to be heard in front of the school committee, the superintendent, and the mayor. Uh, however, uh, we did not have anyone sign up to be heard this evening, so uh, we'll move on with the meeting. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the meeting itself, though, um, the Brockton Public Schools family uh, was saddened to learn of uh, the passing of Pluff, sixth grade student, Charles C.J. Thompson. So I would like to ask everyone to please observe a moment of silence in memory of Charles C.J. Thompson. I, I do want to say, um, when we receive this news, it is such a loss. And whenever you talk about certainly a, lung, a young life uh, gone much too soon. And I want to thank uh, Principal Michelle Nesreller, her entire staff, um, the families and community at the Plouffe School. Uh, they came together. 
They have supported the Thompson family, and certainly when it comes to a situation like this, when the children came to school today, there was, as always, support provided to our students, to our teachers, to our staff members, who clearly got to know CJ for a lot of years in the Brockton Public Schools. He made quite a mark for a young man. There were principals, teachers throughout the district that knew him, his family, offered support. And again, I can't thank the guidance staff enough, John Snellgrove and his staff, who continue to always have the training and is ready to go deal with any situation in our district. This is what makes the Brockton Public Schools great. This is what makes us a family. And we will continue to offer that support uh, as needed. Okay. We have uh, our first order of business is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is a... Uh, a block of items uh, that represent uh, generally pretty routine business uh, for the school committee to conduct. So in order to keep our meeting moving along, uh, we uh, consider this uh, block of items as, as one item. However, uh, any individual school committee member may request that we remove any specific item from the consent agenda for individual consideration and deliberation. So at this time, I'll ask if there are any members of the committee who would like to remove an item from the consent agenda. Mr. Minichella. What is it? Item F. F. <coughs> okay. Item F will be removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Sullivan. C, D, and E. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So first, let's uh, entertain a motion on the consent agenda minus items C, D, E, and F. Consent agenda minus C, D, E, and F. Motion's been made. Seconded by Mr. Sullivan. All in favor? Approved. So the consent agenda is approved minus those four items. We'll go to Mr. Minicello first. Uh, Tom, item F. Um, item F is the acceptance of the scholarship uh, that is dedicated to Robert Ferrante. Um, Mr. Ferrante worked here at the, uh, for the Brockton Public Schools uh, in the music and band department. Uh, he was over at West. Um, he was also a member of the Dale and the Duds, um, a very dedicated um, teacher, instructor, and loved students, and, and certainly loved uh, the community in which he worked. Um, there's a very generous scholarship uh, being created in his name. Uh, so I'll just read from the um, materials. The Robert Ferrante Memorial Scholarship is a thousand dollar scholarship that will be awarded in the memory of Mr. Ferrante to a graduating student from the class of 2016 who has been a participant in high school instrumental program during his or her school career. A uh, student will be chosen based on academic merit and financial need. The scholarships to be used to help defray expenses upon enrollment to a four-year university or college. Um, so it's very um, generous that uh, the family and friends do this and uh, um, we all certainly remember Mr. Ferranti. Um, as, as a dedicated person to our school system and to our students. So I just thought it'd be noteworthy to mention that. Mr. Fraley, would you like to come down and say a few words? Thank you. Um, as you said, uh, Bob was, uh, I, I call him Bob, I've known him for so, so many years and, uh, uh, and I was happy to get him off from selling cars to come and teach back. He was previously at, uh, in uh, Holbrook and also in uh, Plymouth and then they riffed him from there or back in those days when we were riffing some people and he uh, first try didn't work and uh, the second try did work and uh, he was here for about 18 years and took over West Junior High and Bob was a character and, and a half and uh, uh, very close friends of mine professionally we, we play professionally and I tell you that the hardest thing that I've ever done in my in my, my life is actually to perform for him uh, with our quintet when he decided to write everything he wanted to uh, to do 
uh, it was such a such an, an inspiration for me that uh, uh, that uh, was uh, absolutely unbelievable. We, he talked to me over the phone and then just said, "Okay, this is what I want done," and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I constantly uh, talked to him. But he his, his big thing was with the kids, um, and we were blessed in Brockton to, to have him here as a as just a, a great teacher. So, just a note uh, that on uh, April, uh, April 5th, I think it's a Wednesday, if I'm not sure, where that's our regular spring concert before we uh, uh, travel to uh, New York to per participate in the uh, the uh, um, band festivals. Uh, on Thursday, we are doing a little presentation for, for Bob's in, on this stage. Um, and actually, I'm trying to work out so we can get the deal and the dust to actually perform with us. So it'll be quite a thing. So uh, I think it's 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 a Tuesday night. I'm sorry about that again. But um, and but many will be here. That's our regular spring concert. Two bands will be performing and we'll do a little presentation for, for Bob. And I talked to Tina. And I'm very, very happy and uh, honored to have uh, his name uh, to be added to our scholarship. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Tom? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. In Mr. Ferrante's memory, um, there was nobody more positive with the kids. I think I shared that with you a couple of months ago. It didn't matter if you were the best player when you were talking about middle school age students, elementary students, but he was in the middle school at the time. Uh, my daughter was actually one of the students. She was not gifted by any means, <laughs> but he, again, made them feel like a million dollars and, and truly tried to inspire so many of our students, and I think we're going to see that for years to come. So, thank you to the Ferrante family. Accept the Robert Ferrante Scholarship. Yes, basically I just had a question or a clarification on the three. I have no problem with the going out of state, but the number of chaperones, I wasn't, is it supposed to be 10 or is there a policy on that? Um, I, I mean, uh, Ten students in a chaperone. Um, I'm not exactly sure the numbers. Uh, the reason two of them are pulled out, they each have ten. I mean, every ten students is a chaperone. Thirty students with three chaperones. That is uh, with a tour going to uh, the University of Connecticut. That's upward bound. I'm just looking, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, the ski trip is the, is missing one. Uh, school. Two club advisors and two teachers, so that's uh, four. And I was just assuming they're going to fill up the bus, 50 yeah, people. I, I don't know what those numbers are for the ski club. But what I will assure you, and I will make sure we follow up with this, is that there is a chaperone for every 10 students. I just don't have that number. I'm not sure. Uh, Principal Wolder can certainly get those numbers for us. So we'll make sure. Uh, does anyone know if is, is it uh, one chaperone per 10 students? I'm getting, okay. It just, it just needs to be one shot on that. Okay. If we could get that one. <clears throat> Absolutely. If we can, I'd, I'd make the motion to approve. All three, All C, three. D, and E. Okay, so we, uh, after discussion, have a motion mm -hmm. to approve uh, agenda items C, D and E as a block. Second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. All right, so at this point, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to Superintendent of Schools Smith uh, for her report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. And as always, uh, I'd like to introduce our student representative from Brockton High, Gavin Rocher, who will update us on what's happening at the high school. Sure. Um, I just want to start out by saying congratulations to the DECA. What they competed at districts competition. Uh, all of them are moving to onto states in March, including myself. I got second, and a group got first. FebFest was this past weekend. Students directed their own plays. It got moved to Sunday due to weather. Report cards went out. Uh, February 3rd and then this Thursday there's a fundraiser for DECA at Bertucci's a certain percentage of the 
bill will be donated to DECA program itself. And that's it. Very good. And Gavin, were the students happy to be back at school today after a long weekend? <laughs> well, you know what, I don't know what's going on here, but if you look back, and we did have this conversation, I had promised to give everybody off the day after the Super Bowl. That was assuming the Patriots were in at the time, by the way, yeah. and they should have been. So this has been two years running that we have had heavy snow and snow days on the day after Super Bowl. So we're just lucky. <laughs> So anyway, thank you, Gavin. You're welcome. Um, going into um, our bilingual department is doing a presentation. And again, we have many new members on our school committee. And just to let you know what we've been doing all year is presentations by our city departments. Um, I continually have lots of questions myself. So pl please feel free tonight. We have our director, uh, Kelly Jones, uh, her assistant director, Olga. Thank you. Drawing a Vula. Vula. <laughs> That's okay. And they'll be presenting to us uh, on our bilingual department. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Jones. I'm the Director of Bilingual Education for Brockton Public Schools. And I just want to give you a little overview of um, who are the students who are involved with our department. Um, our population is a fluid one, and as of January 27th, 3,502 were identified as limited English proficient, meaning they have not yet attained English proficiency. 643 are identified as formally limited English proficient, or FLEP. Those are students who have attained English proficiency within two years the past two years and are being monitored and followed by the Department of Bilingual in the ESL services. 873 are identified as fully exited. That means they've been um, reclassified between three and four years ago. So they're fully exited from services, but they're, they're um, recent, recently exited. And we have 36.9% of our total population um, identified as first language, not English. That means um, the English of the language of the home and the first language spoken by the child is not English. Of the students who are identified as limited English proficient, the majority of them um, are Cape Verdean, followed by Haitian and Spanish and Portuguese. We have um, over 30 languages represented in Brockton Public Schools. We have Vietnamese, Quechua, Chinese, French, Bangla, and then 22 speak other languages. Now, the students who are English language learners are at a variety of English language proficiency levels. Um, these are the numbers but they don't include the students who were enrolled in Brockton Public Schools after February 1st of 2015. So these numbers don't include um, kindergartners or newly arrived students who have entered our schools since uh, February 1st. And you can see the, ma the majority of our students are in levels three and levels four of English language development, meaning they have high levels of social language and academic language and are uh, progressing in their English. This um, slide tells the story of the growth of the English language learner population in Brockton Public Schools. And you can see that we had a very stable growth until 2008. Um, and, and we've had very marked growth since then. With FLEPS, they, um, they, they, inc they report a large proportion of our entire student body. So between 2008 and 2015, we saw a marked increase. And between, just between 2008 and 2009, our English learner population grew 51.6%. And between 2009 and 2011, it was an additional 33.8%. And if you compare between um, 2008 and 2014, our English learner population increased by 115.8%. 
Um, our, I'll, I'll not read our vision and mission for you, but our, our goal in the Department of Bilingual ESL Services is to um, take the, the language abilities that our students come in with, see it as a valuable asset, cultivate this linguistic ability in a rigorous yet supportive environment, and to attain English proficiency. <coughs> We have a variety of, of programming options for English language learners and they're really tailored to the English language development needs of the students. Um, at the elementary level, at the lowest, the earliest levels of English language development, we offer structured English immersion in a self-contained setting and whole class ESL instruction. Once students achieve a level of English proficiency, they're offered structured English immersion in an integrated setting with a, either a push-in or a pull-out ESL model. We have a Spanish two-way program at the George School, and we have the UNIDOS Pilot Portuguese program, which will be opening in the fall of 2016 at the Raymond School. At, at middle school, we offer con as well structured English immersion, self-contained studies, and integrated setting, and a two-way program. But we also offer transitional bilingual education and whole class ESL. Those are for our newly arrived students, where connection to the first language is paramount to accessing content and developing academic um, literacy. At Brockton High School, we offer the same programs as we do at the middle school, but we've added a literacy cluster for those students who enter our school system with gaps in their education and unique literacy development needs, as well as a medical interpretation program whereby students who are bilingual and biliterate can attain a, a medical interpretation certificate, pro, um, certificate with an internship. At the uh, alternative schools, at Edison Academy and the other alternative schools, we offer content with SEI endorsed teachers plus English as a second language instruction. Now, this, this varied and tailored programming for the English language development needs of our <coughs> students leads to um, great progress as assessed on the ACCESS test. The 2015 progress on ACCESS, our state target was 51% while our district performance was 53% exceeding that target. Um, our attainment level, which is achieving proficiency in English, our state target was 20%, but our district performance was 21%. Participation rate on access. The participation rate on access is what counts towards participation for the CPI. The state target is 95%, and we had 99% of our students um, take access last year. What's really remarkable is as our students are achieving English, um, they're also developing in their content. And once students are flipped, meaning they've achieved English proficiency, you can see that on the MCAS ELA, their CPI is 87.8, which exceeds the all student CPI of 75.9. And in math, the FLEP CPI is 76.6, .6, while all students, CPI should be CPI, not CPR, is 66.7. So our students are achieving English proficiency and content standards simultaneously, and they're able to demonstrate that on standardized tests once they've achieved proficiency. Moving forward, there's a lot that's going on in the field of English learner education. In 2015, in August, there was a new guidance that set state requirements for identification, programming, and classification. And you can see on the right-hand side of the PowerPoint, um, students who are in WIDA levels one to low level three are now supposed to um, receive two to three periods at of ESL no less than 45 minutes each day, delivered by a licensed ESL teacher. Students who are at levels three through five should have at least one period of no less than 45 minutes per day of direct ESL instruction delivered by an ESL teacher. That is uh, in addition to the content being, being served by a, an SEI endorsed teacher. We also have um, Department of Justice involvement with uh, 
Boston, now Worcester, Springfield, Holyoke, and Somerville. And I put this up there because Boston, uh, Brockton is the fourth largest um, community in uh, Massachusetts, and you can see the first three communities have Department of Justice involvement, Boston, Worcester, and Springfield. Um, and then we have ESSA, the new federal law, which will require um, items like monitoring FLEP students for four years instead of two years. So, so there's, there's a lot of changes um, in, in the field of English learner education. Um, I, I chose this quote from the superintendent because it, it really encompasses who we are as a gateway city. And the Brockton Enterprise on January 7th, she said, we are a gateway city that has a history of welcoming people from all over the globe. It's important for children to learn languages and we have chosen cultural and linguistic diversity that reflects the flavor of our vibrant community. This was not part of it, but this extends her um, quote. Uh, these programs will benefit families, business owners, and others for many years to come. So I'm going to talk an, a little bit uh, about the seal of biliteracy. This is a pilot program that we'd like to um, extend to the high school, and Vula Rumis has been working with this in collaboration with the Foreign Languages Department. Good evening, everybody. Vula Rumis, Department Head, K through 8 in the bilingual department. So as Kelly mentioned, thank you. Um, it's been a collaboration between uh, Kelly, Jane Rizzitano, who coordinates foreign languages here at the middle school and high school, as well as myself. Uh, Brockton is one of the uh, towns and cities that is piloting this seal of biliteracy that has uh, extended across the, the nation. So why do we, uh, what is the seal of biliteracy? First of all, it is an award uh, on the high school transcript uh, that indicates a high rate of proficiency in at least two languages, English and one other language. Now the uh, notation on the transcript can be in the form of an actual seal or a stamp um, and that's something that we, we can decide as, as, a, as a district ourselves. Now research shows that becoming bilingual has long-term cognitive, cultural and economic benefits. So uh, we are at the forefront as one of the huge urban districts of being able to incorporate foreign language and having so many language learners to encourage uh, enrollment in further language learning from the middle school to the high school. Uh, we have so many people with cultural uh, backgrounds that we can all benefit from. So this is an addition to English as well. Uh, the last uh, bullet point there to prepare students for the 21st century is what a lot of the states are seeing that being uh, bilingual or multilingual has far-reaching effects in the labor market and global society uh, because one becomes more familiar with other cultures, uh, understanding viewpoints, uh, certainly effective communication, and lots of businesses and colleges are seeking candidates who speak multiple languages. Um, Across the country, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, there are many states that have already adopted a state seal from the state level. Their departments of education uh, are the ones that uh, actually issue the seal on every district's transcript for their high school graduates. Uh, you see here that many are under construction, Massachusetts being one of them, and many others also um, piloting it across the nation. There are uh, several towns, not all of them huge urban districts, uh, Boston and uh, Brockton. We are part of this committee, uh, the steering committee piloting locally. And you can see some of the other towns, Holliston, Andover, Sharon, so forth, who have uh, also p uh, decided to pilot this at their level. Uh, we are in good company. I'm in one of those committees with them and I think 
in our case in Brockton, we have such great structures in place uh, that it came a lot easier for Brockton to institute it as a pilot uh, as opposed to some of those other towns. Some of these towns, you can imagine, don't have huge bilingual populations uh, or departments such as the bilingual department, so their seal of biliteracy is being um, run by the foreign language department. We are uh, at a better point because we have both of these departments uh, working. So the pathways to the seal of biliteracy are at three stages. We recognize and award children at grade five who have attained a certain level of proficiency, again at middle school and then high school where they actually get the seal on the transcript. Uh, at grade five, it may be a, a certificate recognition and grade eight, the same thing. One of the publishers who has created a seal for the state of California is offering the seal free of charge, uh, which we are um, taking advantage of, and they will send the seals to us for the fifth and the eighth graders to put on our certificates that we award uh, when we recognize them. And there are many wonderful ways for all children to, uh, to reach these paths towards the seal of biliteracy. Uh, certainly, we have dual language programs here in Brockton that take advantage of that. We have our foreign language, but this is also going to be available to students who study abroad or who go to language classes on the weekends. Their, their families send them to Chinese school or Arabic school or uh, Vietnamese language classes. So this will be open to all the kids, not just the ones that take foreign languages. In, in Brockton. Uh, and there are a certain number of uh, points and criteria that we have set up that includes a certain level of proficiency in English uh, based on MCAS or PARC, uh, classroom assessments, they have to write an essay, classroom performance, community involvement. It's uh, quite a, a list of criteria that the students, and it will be implemented at the high school through the foreign language department. But along the way at the elementary level, uh, there will be myself and then at the middle school someone else that will also uh, coordinate that at those points. Any questions? Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Hi. Sure. Um, so, so there are different ways of structuring um, kind of conceptions around language development. WIDA has six levels of English language development and it's, and it's kind of um, gone through with the access test. So, so their ELD level is their WIDA level, but because it's measured on WIDA access, we've been calling it the WIDA level because a few years ago we had MEPA levels and a few years before that we had LAO levels and so, so we use WIDA levels now, which is the same as English language development level. Practice. Uh, and and, and moving from moving from MIPA to um, yeah, WIDA, we we've, yeah, we've moved from a five-point kind of rubric to a six-point rubric. Okay. I had another question as well. Um, I had a constituent call me this week. Uh, there was a child that they're involved in with who had um, an IEP, and they were also in an SEI class, um, and I wasn't able to answer the question completely because I know some schools have programs that combine the two and the students are able to get all the minutes that they require. Um, do we have that in the, in the district or how do we serve those children? So, so students who are in our self-contained SEI programs are often serviced by um, MSN teachers who, or speech and language pathologists who speak the student's primary language. Right. Um, 
not being as large of a district as, say, Boston, we do not have inclusion programs for English language learners or substantially separate programs for English language learners. If students need those services, then they are placed in those programs and the building ESL teacher um, services the child and works collaboratively with the primary teacher to ensure that his English language development needs are being met. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, hi. Nice presentation. Thank you. You had mentioned there's about four or five cities that are involved with the Department of Justice? Yes. Does that mean they're doing something wrong? Um, it means that according to the Department of Justice, they're, they are not being provided an equitable education. Uh, they don't have equal access to a meaningful education. So different districts um, are involved for different reasons, um, but, but they, they are involved with the, the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, to ensure that we as a state provide structures to provide meaningful access to the an education. Um, and they are, on the, they are involved in the three other largest districts. Brockton is out of that though? Brockton has not been um, uh, involved with the Department of Justice. Thank you. Oh, yes. A uh, couple things. Um, one, what is the average number of students that is in, um, you know, an ESL class? Um, an, an ESL class, or well, in our structured English immersion classrooms at the elementary level, they are comparable um, to the regular education. Okay. So um, numbers are, are higher in the district and the numbers in our SEI classrooms are higher as well. In, in, um, in ISCI, they are spread across the, the regular ed classrooms and so, so they um, are often pulled by the e building ESL teacher or they are, they go, the ESL teacher goes into that room um, to provide support services. At the middle and high school, um, all of the classes are, are full classes. So, so teachers have um, l numbers that are comparable to the regular education. Okay. Um, and also there were a couple of terms that if you could maybe explain to me a little bit. Um, I noticed there was, I think it was um, pull out, push in, two-way classes. Can you tell me a little more about what that means? Sure. So, so um, pull out or push in is just a method to deliver English as a second language instruction. If the students are being pulled out, it means they're being removed from their classroom into a, a, another small group setting to receive that instruction. If it's pushed in, the teacher is physically going into the classroom to provide those services. Two-way program is our Spanish English program at the George School. That is a 50-50 dual language program where half the students are native English speakers and half the students are native Spanish speakers. And the students in this program receive 50% of their instruction in English and 50% of their instruction in Spanish. So they are going to have um, content, mathematics, science, social studies, literacy in both Spanish and in English. And that is uh, comparable to the model that we're planning on piloting in the fall with Portuguese. Um, Portuguese, we will have a 50-50 model. 50% 50 of the instruction will be in Portuguese and 50% of the instruction will be in English. The goal of these two programs is really a, a little bit different than structured English immersion. The goal of, the, of these dual language programs is to promote bilingualism and biliteracy um, from the earliest um, levels of, of schooling. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and also, WIDA, what is that? WIDA stands for World Class Instructional Design and Assessment. It is the standards for um, English language development that the state adopted in 2012. And it, it, that those levels of English language development are assessed each January on the access tests. And so our students are, are, have finished or are finishing this week this round of testing. All right.
Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. It. Yes. Yes. It, it was the first one in Massachusetts. Um, the students get a certificate of medical interpretation. They're placed at an internship. Um, and what's remarkable is that Martha's Vineyard just last week um, implemented a comparable uh, program modeled on, modeled on, on Brockton to receive um, a certificate program. So many of our teacher, many of our students graduate um, with this um, the skill set, and they are employed by area hospitals um, to to provide services to families. That gets a lot of recognition publicly. It, it, yeah. Yes. Is and that only available to bilingual students? They have to demonstrate proficiency in multiple languages. So um, our, our two-way students, our, our Spanish-English two-way students, last year, was it last year? Mm -hmm. Was our first graduating class. And so we had students who have gone through that program being able to participate in uh, the medical interpretation or advanced placement courses or the international baccalaureate program because they had this, this um, linguistic skill set really great. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. The difference between our Spanish um, program and the Portuguese, you yes. know, one's dual enrollment, one's two-way, just right. so that people know the difference. So um, we will be having a forum tomorrow for the community if anybody would like to come. <coughs> um, about the Portuguese program. So our, our two-way program at the George, the population is made up of Spanish speakers and English speakers. And our Portuguese program is going to be open to any child, any family who, who um, wishes to have uh, bilingualism and biliteracy in Portuguese and English. So while both programs are going to be 50-50 in terms of instruction, they're not 50-50 in terms of population. There will be no Portuguese side and no English side. There will just be two classes of, of speakers who will be learning both uh, Portuguese and English throughout their educational career. Thank you. Important point. Important point for people to understand. Yes, you know. yes. Because some people might, if they're familiar with the two-way, right. might say, oh, wait a minute, my kid doesn't speak Portuguese, so I'm not even going to apply. Right. But that's not the case. We're hoping that, that this will be an opportunity for any <coughs> family who, who wishes to participate in it. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you to Kelly. And uh, what I want to say also is that we look at our state and we mentioned the Department of Justice being in some districts. We certainly don't want them here. And I think because of the type of instruction, the type of programs, the integration in our teaching and learning, all of that goes on very naturally here uh, with an excellent staff who when you talk about the Department of Education and you talk about right now a retail test, our actually course coursework going on where teachers that are teaching English language learner students need to take about, is it 50 hours? Of uh, 45 hours. But our, many of the trainers throughout the state come from the Brockton Public Schools. So the state comes here, they certainly have used our staff to train teachers all over that need to get this uh, certification or mm -hmm. endorsement. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very proud of what happens in Brockton. I think we're very progressive. There are things that we continually like to do when you look at even our strategic plan and you talk about you know community engagement. One of the first things we <coughs> talked about and, and we truly had uh, our sights set on different things that because of a very difficult budget haven't, hasn't naturally happened the way we wanted, but we're looking at cultural proficiency. And when you see some of the things happening, we're able to, through some grant money, uh, we have three uh, paras on board who are assisting and informing our bilingual parents, making sure that they're part of the process. When we talk budget, they're going to be part of the process. Wanting things for their students, we'll make sure that there's outreach. So there are many things happening, again, in our bilingual department that they support that really enrich the lives of our students and families of other speaking other languages, but also our students in the Brockton Public Schools and our families. So again, I think it's a very progressive agenda. I want to thank our leadership team here for all that they do. 
and again, when you look at that district capacity project, uh, and I know I want to remind everybody, uh, I see Kim Gibson up there, uh, again, supporting and has continually been a strong presence with um, our union. Uh, Tom Minicello, again, represented our school committee, and this goes back to, I want to say, 2012. Mm -hmm. That's how long this has been in progress, and certainly the superintendent. So that has been, uh, again, a project that we're very excited uh, about uh, what's going to be happening uh, in September of 2016. So thank you to everybody for all of that hard work. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I want to give you an update, as it says here, on the FY17 budget update. Um, we were anticipating um, figures coming in, as they always do this time of year. And I want to remind everybody that we are a district that is heavily dependent on support from the state. We're a gateway city. Um, we continue to, to struggle uh, to meet the needs of our community, but again, we come together and we continually find ways to support, as you can see, the success of our students. And we've had a lot of success looking at the large numbers of bilingual students, looking at our poverty rates in Brockton, looking, again, I continually say to you, there are no fees. Students have access to athletics. They have access to the arts, to music, all of those things to develop the whole child. So the mayor and I have been looking very carefully as the budget figures have come down from the state. And I want to tell you that we're being very active or proactive as far as making sure that everybody is educated on the figures as we are seeing them. So the mayor has set up uh, a meeting uh, coming up very soon with our legislative delegation because Governor Baker has put out House uh, Budget 2, as it's called. So we're looking at those figures. And I'm going to tell you, and I, I think the mayor would join me in that I am disappointed with the figures. We spent a lot of time last year, you've heard me talk about Aldo Petronio, going throughout the state, responding to the Chapter 70 Commission, wanting to hear about the struggles that districts have with meeting foundation under Chapter 70, the very formula that supports us. Many of the recommendations came out in late October, early November, and I'm disappointed to say that in looking at House Budget 2, not one, and I mean not one, of those recommendations were, were followed. So we will be having a discussion with our legislative delegation. I know we're looking at some of the stresses on our budget, when you talk about, um, again, our, our federal uh, representation, and we look again at McKinney-Vento, we're looking again at a federal uh, program of economically disadvantaged versus low income, which again is something that is coming, but it has affected our district, and I think it needs a second look, or we need to be able to certainly have a voice. Uh, we're talking to, again, our state delegation, and certainly the mayor uh, has to provide services to everybody in the city of Brockton. So I, I want you to know we're being very proactive and we will continue to, to look at this budget. But there has been communication, and I know this actually came to the school committee from the uh, Mass Association of School Committees. They're you know, talking again about their disappointment with the budget coming out. The Mass Association for School Superintendents is very disappointed with the budget figures coming out. So we will continue to, to work on this. I think I would just add that uh I think the superintendent is probably being kind uh, when she says that the governor's budget, you know, didn't address the Chapter 70 Commission recommendations. Not only did it ignore the recommendations, there are changes in there that actually hurt gateway cities like Brockton and benefit suburbs. So, uh, if there aren't significant changes in the House and Senate budgets. Uh, this could be the worst budget year the city has faced in 30 some odd years. It's potentially that devastating. So I think the superintendent and I are working together on this almost daily. Um, uh, we are going to be meeting on the Monday holiday uh, next Monday with our state legislative delegation. Uh, they're all coming in to meet with us next Monday afternoon um, because we're going to really need their help up on Beacon Hill. Uh, and I think also uh, the superintendent has a legislative function set up for later in the month. And uh, you should have also received emails from me today with an invitation uh, to a joint uh, budget summit. And what I'm looking to do is bring the school committee and the city council together for a joint presentation by both Aldo Petronio and Jay Condon. Because the superintendent and I have talked about this 
you know, the, the city budget is almost like two budgets within one budget. About half of the city budget is on the school side. The other half is the rest of city government non-school. And uh, I think on having served on the school committee and now as mayor, it's easy to get very focused on your half of the budget without paying too close attention to what's going on across the street. And I think when we're facing a year coming up like we're facing this year, I think it's really important for, for the school committee members to have some insight as to what the overall budget looks like and, and what some of the constraints and challenges are. And in the same token, you know, I think the superintendent feels, and, and I agree that it's very important for the, for the city council and the mayor and the people on the city side to understand the size of the challenges and the size of the shortfall on the, on the school side. And I, I think it's having done four school budgets and one city budget before this, I don't know that there's ever been a whole lot of communication between the council and the school committee in terms of what each other's budgets look like. So um, uh, Jay and Aldo will be making the presentation with the superintendent. I will certainly both be there to answer questions. Um, and it may seem a little early, but it's not because this is a crucial time right now in terms of lobbying up at the State House to hopefully get some changes in the uh, Senate and House versions of the budget that could uh, make this uh, upcoming budget less devastating uh, to a city like Brockton. So, you know, we're pledged to work together and take this on. There are going to be some really tough decisions that are going to have to be made. But I think right now our immediate focus has to be on seeing if we can advocate for some changes in the Senate and House versions of the budget that would hopefully survive a conference committee. But uh, this, is a, this is a budget that takes, a, the governor's proposed budget is a budget that takes away from cities like Brockton. There's no other way to say it. So we're going to take this challenge on and I think that also in light of the fact that the recommendations of the Chapter 70 Commission are being totally ignored by the state. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the school committee and the superintendent and I need to continue the conversation as to what legal steps would make sense for us to take to compel uh, the state to make sure that um, all children growing up in the state have equal opportunity to education. and. It, the quality of your education should not be tied to how affluent of a community you live in. Um, and I think that we're going to be looking at that together also because uh, that's not going to provide the instant answer, but it's probably the long-term answer. Uh, today at our executive team meeting, uh, I've asked uh, Dr. Sal Tarasi to head this up. I know he has started to do outreach and had conversation. Uh, we talked previously about the McDuffie case many years ago. I think I had informed you at the time that I spoke to Michael Weissman, who was the attorney on that case. I've spoke to him recently. Um, he's not available to do this pro bono at this time. Uh, this would be something that we would have to consider. Are there other districts being harmed the way that Brockton is harmed, other Gateway City urban districts? So we will start to do the legwork, uh, start to make those phone calls, start to ask those very questions that we need to share with you. That will be a part of, you know, certainly this budget process going forward. I've also spoken to the mayor and, you know, I've been out there uh, at a number of PAC meetings. Um, I will continue to do that. And what we really want to do, this isn't finger pointing, it's raising awareness with our own parents about the kinds of things that we want for our children in the Brockton Public Schools, in the city of Brockton families, and to be able to advocate at all levels, as I said, the federal level, you know, the state level, um, our city level. And you've heard me say, when we talk about the McKinney Vento, and that's transportation for our homeless students, which hits the city with a million dollars, you know, it's not that we don't want these children here. We certainly do. There's no place better. There's no faculty able to address their needs. Um, but the reality is, it is a, a stressor on the budget, and we need to take a look at that. There are certainly other ways. It, it, it can't be the same old way times are changing. When you talk about, you know, three and four hotels in Brockton, you know, being the place because of what has happened with, you know, foreclosures and, and the housing market. So again, these are things that we need to take a look at and, and bring in our uh, legislators, our representatives from the federal government. So there's a lot of layers here. And I think, again, parents need to be educated to the best of our ability and community members to really join us 
uh, and make sure that we as a community are um, certainly staffed and uh, are able to support the needs of our students and our city. Yeah. I think the presentation we just saw really outlines one of the major challenges that we face uh, that costs a lot of money and that's the fact that you know one-third of our students are not yet proficient in English and that's not the case when you visit a lot of the affluent suburbs and they're not spending anywhere near the percentage of their budget on English language education that that we are and again we take the challenge on and we're working hard to get kids proficient in English as quickly as we can but it requires an additional investment that we have to make that a lot of communities don't have to make and that additional investment has to be represented in the chapter 70 formula and it is but not to the extent that it needs to be uh, it's, it does not come anywhere close to, uh, to offsetting the additional costs we incur and you know we just don't have the tax base that a lot of most more affluent communities have to raise the money in property taxes so um, the challenges are there. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll have the superintendent and I and our CFOs will have a good meeting with the state legislative delegation on Monday. I'm hoping that this, the majority of the councilors and school committee members can get together for our uh, budget summit and then the superintendent will be hosting the legislative uh, program coming up a little bit later in the month also. So I think all of these are going to be very important for us to be communicating exactly uh, the challenges that we're facing and what are some action steps that we can take now to address it. Tom. You rightly said, uh, Mr. Mayor, and it was discussed at our retreat, that now is the time that we need to prepare and pursue uh, an action because, like you said, the task force basically laid out a lot of our case. The task force you know, highlighted the issues that need to be addressed and, you know, we were hoping that the Chapter 70, um, you know, reformation with regard to how the funding would be calculated was going to address that and now that we basically see they're going in the opposite direction, um, like you said, ELL, special ed, high rates of poverty, um, transient families, homeless families, all of these burdens um, befall cities like Brockton, Springfield, Worcester, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet we're being this year penalized based on what we're seeing at this point. Uh, we're going in the opposite direction, um, which is really outrageous. So um, we, like uh, the superintendent said, um, Mr. Tarasi is going to try to do some due diligence with regard to finding some um, parties that may be interested in helping us bring an action. Um, but um, it's something that uh, the time is now ripe um, because Brockton's not going to be able to afford to have a high functioning system like we do. There is a reason why the Brockton Public Schools uh, do not have level four schools because we know what it takes. We do our best to meet that burden, but you can only push the envelope so much, and you know it just seems like someone wants to push us over the cliff. Um, so I um, applaud you for um, you know having this joint meeting. Um, it's in line with obviously what um, the schools you know is planning to do as well. Um, you do know that meeting needs to be posted, right? Yes. yes. Way ahead. Okay, good. Just don't want you to make any uh, any mistakes. Okay, good. Excellent. Yeah, on the twentieth. Bill. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think. You know, we all share these these same frustrations of, of looking at you know we figured out how to do it right in Brockton and we should be the model that everybody else is looking at and instead we gotta you know fight to keep it funded so that the mo so we can continue to do what we do but something that um, I think we're all gonna have to do a good job of is making sure we're talking with uh, in our PAC meetings about this. I know uh, the superintendent and I talked at, at Kennedy about this recently and uh, making sure that 
our constituents get involved in it and and you know I feel like for our state and federal level representatives to get the message they're going to have to hear from more than just us it, they, you know we're a city of a hundred we're a hundred thousand strong if we all say something and if we all speak up um, so I guess that's my two cents okay uh, again, I want to congratulate many of you know the movement that we've had with our house masters, uh, a number that have moved up uh, from uh, assistant house masters at Brockton High School, which left uh, an opening. Um, so we have a new uh, interim assistant house master uh, taking place in the Red House, and that is going to be Tracy Chula Montero. So we welcome her to this job, and I know she'll be working with uh, Principal Wolder uh, in her new role. So congratulations to her. And I want to finish up by, uh, I'm sure all of you know this is Black History Month. Uh, I think it's fascinating watching some of the TV specials, the documentaries. I love history. And one of the things that we're going to be awarding to Brockton High School, and I realized that this was our only meeting in the month of February. So I wanted to uh, remind everybody that a year ago in this very uh, little theater auditorium, we had the Tuskegee Airmen come and speak to our students. And when you look at, what do they call them, the greatest generation? Greatest generation. You know, when, when you look at these gentlemen and able to share with the youngsters, the questions from our students at the high school were fascinating. So when they left that day, they gave us a poster. And we, they signed it for us. And we recently had it framed. And we're going to be placing this in the halls of Brockton High School. Uh, for all the students to commemorate uh, that very event. So we're very pleased again for Black History Month to present this to our students at Brockton High School. Put that here. Mr. Thomas, I'm going to have you take this this evening, and tomorrow you can bring it up here in your daily trip. Make and sure back. and um, that's it. Items to refer to subcommittee. I know that during the retreat we had some questions uh, on um, community schools and we talked about uh, looking at minimum wage increase in some of the salaries for uh, certain jobs um, and I know we're going to be looking to do a finance subcommittee meeting. I think uh, Wanda will be setting that up for everybody before we get through the rest of the month. We'll invite Maxine Richardson, the director of community schools, to come and share that information and answer any questions that we had uh, from the retreat. So that would be, um, and would also be setting up, I, I think Mr. Mayor will set up continually looking at our Tuesday evenings when we're not in session uh, to continually look at this budget and look at some of the work we're doing behind the scenes presenting to the school committee. I'd like to set those meetings up, those subcommittee meetings up, you know, unfortunately from now until, until we are ready to, to pass the budget. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do. We'll do new business here. I just also want to make sure that I personally thank everyone uh, that worked so hard to help us get the schools open on time this morning. Uh, if you would ask me yesterday afternoon if that was going to happen, I didn't even think it was a possibility. But uh, with the two storms right in a row, but um, Mike, uh, Ken, and all his people, all of the all of the building maintenance people, the custodians, the grounds crew, everyone that worked so hard on the school property and our DPW crews on the city side um, really had a great effort. We started working at 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon. We were literally getting the last few people's electricity back on that were knocked out in Friday's storm and already meeting for the Monday storm. And um, fortunately, we didn't get quite as much snow as they forecast. But uh, I think we we're one of the very, very few school districts that opened their schools on time this morning. And uh, it may not s seem like a big deal, but I mean, I think part of the conversation the superintendent and I were having at 8 o'clock last night was how important that is to a lot of working families that have their time to get to work in the morning <laughs> built around, you know, dropping their kids off at extended day smart start or, or regular school opening time. And even a one hour delay in opening the schools can really cause a hardship for a lot of working parents. So. I, I just want to express, I, I know how hard we had people working right up until overnight, right up until 6 o'clock this morning to have uh, the schools and the roads and everything ready. So I, I appreciate the great effort that everyone made that allowed us to get the schools open. 
Mr. Mayor, last year I congratulated you publicly here, and I just want to say again, it, it's all I know. Uh, the past two years have been difficult as far as snow, but you do have to see the operation that goes on. So everybody meets at the War Memorial. Uh, the mayor leads us. There's communication from the fire chief, the police chief, uh, BEMA, um, Brockton Area Transit. I mean, it is just probably about 20 people that sit and have discussion. The communication is there so everybody understands what it takes to get this city uh, back going. And even when you look back last year and you know what we dealt with, and to just think, you know, the number of school days, I mean, they were minimal. And thank goodness our children were able to get to school safely. I think the parents, their cooperation is tremendous in making sure that their children get here safely. They stand at bus stops with children. You know, they make sure they help with neighborhood children. So it really is a community effort. And I did have to chuckle last night because when we were there at 8 o'clock, I was informed, I believe, by one of the men from the BEMA operation that there were students flooding the lines, however they did social that. Social media. Yeah. Social media, making sure that they got word to tell the superintendent that school needed to be canceled today. <laughs> yeah. So we chuckled with over a hundred, a hundred messages to BEMA uh, from our students. So I'm glad that they're advocating yeah. and they're yeah. on top of things for us. Yeah. We went by online. There was overwhelming sentiment online to cancel school again today. So. Fortunately, we didn't follow that guidance. Mr. Minicello. On that note, I just want to point out, um, like you did, that uh, you know when you, when you were on the committee, uh, this body, we were very critical with respect to the sidewalks. Um, it was a problem, and um, you know people, we as a body criticized, and but I would just like to say uh, thank you, like you did, to the people that worked because it, there is a noticeable difference with respect to the sidewalk safety. Um, you know, our walk, we have a lot of walkers. We had a subcommittee meeting prior to this meeting about, you know, who takes the bus, who walks. We have a substantial number of walkers. And, um, you know, seeing the sidewalk plows out there um, right, you know, together with, right, right from the, with the plows. Yeah. I mean, you know, whereas, you know, that years past, that was put off right. to whenever, right. if ever. Um, and there's a huge difference and it's, it's you know for the safety of our students um, you know unfortunately some people drive around like there's no snow you know they just drive and think that their two-wheel drive cars are gonna you know behave the same way they do on a dry paved road but um, having those sidewalks is crucial and I know a lot of parents um, and around the schools it's critical and, and um, your departments are doing a great job in terms of yeah making sure those are clear um, in a prompt fashion and like you said they're being done simultaneously with the plowing yeah. it's great thank you I, so I'm in a little bit of a unique position so I'm I, the only the second mayor in the history of the city to go directly from the school committee to being mayor uh, mayor Farwell was the other one and uh, so you do bring a little of that school committee experience with you so uh, Tom's right I did spend four years in the school committee griping every single year about why weren't they getting out and getting the sidewalks done? And under a former commissioner, the policy was different. And they, the old policy was that all the streets had to be completely done, then there had to be a rest period, and then they would bring the sidewalk plows out, which was usually day two or day three. And it made a difference. You couldn't get them done as well and, and all that stuff. So one of the changes we made last year is that we were able to work with all our unions and work out a, a mechanism to do it that we are investing more money so now whenever the decisions made to call out the plows which is usually somewhere between two inches and four inches of snow um, when we call out the street plows the sidewalk plows are called out at the same time they're coming right out at the beginning and in most cases the sidewalks get done twice they get done during the storm and then we go back around a second time to to try to clean them up. So we do ask for people that live on roads that have the sidewalk plows, if they could when they clear their parking lot or driveway and they go block the sidewalk, if they could take a couple minutes just to clear that sidewalk path that we went to a lot of trouble to open up so the kids aren't climbing over these little snow banks as they go down the sidewalk. But I appreciate you mentioning that, John. We've made 
uh, Larry Rowley and, and his team over at DPW are a hard working crew and you know I asked them to come up with a new system last year as to how we're going to do sidewalks and I, I see the difference too. They're not, you can never get them perfect. It's not the same as plowing the street. They're very uneven. There are a lot of obstacles. Um, it's not just like plowing the street. You can't get them perfect but we are getting them as, as, as clear as we possibly can. So. Thank you for mentioning that. I have a Ms. Plant. On that. Yes. Um, I noticed this morning you're on my daughter's The sidewalks are very clear over in that area. However, to the crosswalk, they still have to climb that little pile of snow. Is yeah. that something? I know that's. I, I don't. The sidewalk plow can't do it. Yeah. And I think I'll, I'll ask if there's anything that can be done. I, I think short of having a person shovel it yeah. is probably what would have to happen. If the, we can't push the snow into the street, and I don't think the plow can go over the curb. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point, though. Of course, if this, the crosswalks are supposed to be at the corners, and at the corners there should be a break. So there ought to be I'm able to go I'm picturing one right on, on. Forest Ave right now. I don't think it's directly on the corner. Okay. Where um, I was watching that. I'll I was ask just about wondering that. what the solution would possibly be. I don't know the answer, but I'll ask. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I try to respond to phone calls that come in. I know Deputy Superintendent Thomas gets on it right away. Um, and we work very closely with Larry Rowley and his crew. And um, so again, to parents out there, um, they're certainly doing an excellent job. But let us know if you see something and we'll try to address it. Yep, absolutely. Okay, on the new business, anyone got anything else in the new business? I was going to say, Tom, you're going to disappoint me if you didn't have I'm not, points. yeah. A two-second delay, as they say. Um, at our retreat, we had, as the superintendent pointed out previously, we had discussed the rates with respect to community school. Um, but one of the items that we were also presented with and that we went over uh, were the extended day rates. And um, in order to um, continue to uh, continue on with the state vouchers, and um, there are scholarships in that, or there are no? It's, contracted slots um, we would need to meet uh, for to to qualify and continue on with getting some state aid for those slots and those um, uh, people that qualify to match the uh, private pay rate to correspond with the state rate um, the increases uh, not that anyone likes increases but uh, are very modest with respect to um, the before school program, um, there's a rate increase of 11 cents. With respect to the after school program, a rate increase of 22 cents. Uh, with respect to um, the before and after school, 33 cents. And with respect to full days, holiday, vacation, and summer, um, you're talking an increase of 45 cents. And again, that's to correspond with the new rates set by the state. Um, with regard to the early education and care program. So um, in order to not lose that funding for those uh, uh, state funded slots, I would recommend that we correspond our um, pay rates with respect to uh, uh, individuals that pay uh, to coincide with the state rate and approve those increases I just, um, I just uh, mentioned. Is that, is that a motion? Um, that is a motion. Okay. Second? And then motion on made. the motion, could the superintendent elaborate yep. a little bit more? Yep. Go ahead. Well, uh, this happens at different times. It's kind of the cost of doing business. So the state, again, there, there are many different um, providers that are much smaller than us that are very dependent on those small increases. Uh, and again, in accepting those, uh, it's the cost of doing business. We know that when uh, we have contracts that we negotiate. There are raises and pay for uh, our members that are providing those services and provide an excellent service. Almost a thousand students are in extended day in our community. So those rates correspond, as you said, in order to see those increases, we have to also go up the, that modest amount in our full pay for our full pay parents. And you're talking daily rates. When you talk 11 cents, you know, that's for the day. Or you talk the 45 cents for the vacations and holidays. That's the daily rate increase. So this is not unusual. It happens. Uh, I know Maxine Richardson is in the audience. I want to say maybe once a year. They take a look at, again, cost of living, cost of doing business, 
making sure that providers are able to pay their workers, pay their insurances, pay all of those uh, types of things, and they're pretty reliant on that reimbursement from the state. It happens. They look at it every two to three years. They'll look at rate increases. So that's the last time two years ago. Two years ago. ago. Okay. All right. Well, not that I like it, but it makes me feel a little better. Okay. So okay. We have a motion on the floor, properly seconded in all in favor. Opposed? Under new business, anyone have anything else they'd like to put on the floor? The only thing I, I want to mention is, because I have my brochure here, we have a, a wonderful event coming up in honor of the 50th anniversary of The Sound of Music. And those of you that know uh, Amy Corum, a member of our community, I'm told that 50 years ago, I think it's March 6th, is the event that's going to take place uh, here at Brockton High School. There's actually going to be, we're not sure if it's a baby grand piano or a grand piano truly used by Liberace. And we're going, we're going to hopefully get this on the stage at Brockton High School. And Amy, back as a young girl, performed with an artist on the stage here at Brockton High School. That same artist will be coming. This is in conjunction with the Brockton Symphony Orchestra. It will benefit the Rotary, uh, community programs. So this will happen uh, on March 6th. I believe it's a Sunday. There's a rate of $20 for a family to attend. The flyers were sent out, and then we talked about a, a family rate. So please share that. We're going to be sending out additional flyers to have for the PAC meetings in the schools. And we're also going to be uh, sending out word to the surrounding communities to please come. It's a family event. It should be wonderful, and we look forward to uh, Amy Corum, our own Amy in our community. Uh, I believe. Her father-in-law was the school doctor many years ago. Those of you that know Reva Casteline, this is her sister-in-law and a longtime uh, Brockton family. So we're really excited to to have her perform for all of our children and families. Tom, um, um, every, a lot of people know Bill McGauley. He's the um, uh, basically the chairman of the uh, Brockton Youth Foundation does a lot of great work uh, for our students and, and ch uh, children of the city. Um, he's brought a group together to promote Art Week in Brockton, uh, which uh, is going to basically be more than just a week. It's going to be like a month-long series of events of different um, art exhibits, and when I say art, it could be art in the form of music, art in the form of pottery, art in the form of paintings, art in the form of um, design, clothing designers, um, all sorts of different venues around the city. And what he's uh, attempting to do is to basically put together um, a menu of all the events, um, a group that's going to try to highlight um, add some events, but highlight the events that are ongoing so that the public is aware of when um, and where these events are taking place. So, um, um, so he's, he's really doing a great job so far, and um, I just wanted to put that on the table so that people are aware that in the month of May there will be, you know, Art Week, I think, times four is uh, what their, their logo is going to be, but that this is something uh, very exciting because um, there's uh, downtown with the new um, uh, apartments uh, right across from Mason. Uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, the Enzo Flats. There's a, um, uh, an art, uh, art room, an art gallery, and there's going to be a lot of events there. But again, there'll be events all over the city. And this is something that's going to be highlighted and something that I think a lot of Brocktonians, a lot of people are going to want to visit. Um, and even people from outside the city to, to highlight the talent that we have here in the city. Um, and it's something very positive for the city, something that I think is going to enhance the image of downtown and what this community is all about. Corner of Dover and Warren Ave. That's really cool if you haven't seen that yet. Okay. Any other takers? All right. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn has been made. No one else wants to adjourn? Sit. All in favor? Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>